Women's Election Watch 2013. I'm your host, Teresa Whipple, and today we are going to be talking with Edmonds City Council candidates. Uh, and I would like to welcome Council Member Adrian Fraley Manillas. Welcome to the program. Thank you, Teresa. Looking forward to it. Yeah. I'd like to start by just having you talk about uh, your background and how long you've been in Edmonds and uh, a little bit about why you are running for re-election. That's great. Um, well, my background is I was born and raised in Richmond Beach, and I've pretty much lived in the area my whole, my pretty much my whole life. Um, I've lived in the house um, up by Lake Ballinger for 28 years, so I lived in Edmonds most of my life, I guess you would say. I'm interested in continuing to um, work on the issues that are facing the Edmonds citizens and Edmonds as itself as a whole, everything from the environment to our budget to um, my my most recent concern, which is the development of Highway 99. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I know that something that you have talked a lot about has been um, a focus on all of Edmonds and on all the neighborhoods in Edmonds, which um, I know that sometimes yes. we do get a little downtown centric in our discussions. So um, that's important to you, isn't it? Oh, very, very, very important. Um, the majority of people actually don't just live in one area. They live in all areas of Edmonds. And I think we need to really focus on what we're doing in those areas and why we're doing it and get input from the citizens that live in each one of those areas. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and what do you think is the most important issue facing Edmonds and, and why? Mm, that's, a, that's a good question. Well, our budget looks pretty good right now. I don't know if um, you've been made aware, but we seem to be um, sitting in the black by the to the tune of anywhere from nine to eleven million dollars. So um, we've canceled um, the levy we considered again for the second time, and it looks like things are looking up for us. So that's really, really a good thing. I think the most important thing right now, in my opinion, in Edmonds, is the development of Highway 99 for a number of reasons. One of the reasons, one of the main reasons I have to say, I've been meeting with focus groups of citizens and some of the business owners up and down Highway 99 in Edmonds, the different neighborhoods in that area, and our crime rate has increased dramatically in that area. Um, and it's not just um, crime you don't see, such as maybe burglaries, but it also has to do with what you do see, um, drug violence, drug busts, um, prostitution. There's a whole number of issues that are occurring out in the Highway 99 area that are moving out into our neighborhoods right now. So I'm interested in creating a vibrant community where people want to come, want to live, want to shop up on the 99 corridor. And you think that will address some of the crime issues? I think that will help. I think having people, having people live and work there is the one arena that will get people to pay attention to the area up there. Right now it's, you know, if you drive through there you see a lot of vacant lots, you see a lot of vacant storefronts, you see um, a lot of, of an environment that's not really welcoming to people to move into. So one of the things we're looking at is changing maybe some of the zoning up there to allow for a mixed use sort of um, living sorts of situations up there and in in my discussions with some of the business owners up there there is some interest in creating mixed-use housing through there and this is absolutely the most perfect time for us to start moving on the highway 99 development one of the main reasons is is the 65 million dollar remodel that's going to be going in at swedish at edmonds mm -hmm. Um, we've opened up the new cancer center, we've opened up the new bone clinic, we're opening up, the, they're in the process of building the new health district um, clinic that's going in up on 99, and we have to have some place to house all those people that are working in these areas. That's hundreds and hundreds of people, and right now, for them to have affordable housing as employees, they have to go to Linwood or Shoreline because we just don't have the capacity built in that area right now. So that's a real important issue, I think, for us as citizens is to pursue this forward. 
once we have the development of 99 worked on, people will start looking at that area differently. And I think a lot of it has to do with attitudes of, of people that go through that area because it is the gateway to Edmonds. And if, if they see areas where there's vacant buildings and there's maybe prostitution or undesirables in various areas, they don't stop. And so we've got to make people want to stop and stay and enjoy that part of Edmonds because it's a very lovely, vibrant part. Mm -hmm. okay. And just one more thing on Highway 99 sure. that I, I would be curious about is when I think of Highway 99 redevelopment, I think of what happened in Shoreline with all of the, you know, kind of the nice green space and things like that mm -hmm. that they have and they have brought in quite a few developments sure. are you envisioning something like that for I mean I know it's probably a matter of money right it, to right. an extent right right that is quite a that would I'm not quite sure how much that cost I know it was like a hundred and twenty million dollars or something for the whole development of it so I think right now um, what I'm mostly interested in to, is taking the baby steps, and the baby steps are changing the zoning to allow people to build the sorts of housing and businesses up there that will draw people to it. Next step will be actually the sidewalks and the roads, and you know, we are currently um, working on some improvements in the 99 area. And those are, are soon to come. You know, we're going to have a, a cut through on 138th, I believe it is, that'll take us right in. Oh, excuse me, not 138. 220? Excuse me. 8 something. 228th, maybe yeah, that's it. Yeah. That'll, they'll actually right. cut right through, that'll go yeah. into Mount Lake Terrace. Mm -hmm. And that's the other key to this is that um, transit has talked about moving light rail by 2025 up to the station up onto, mm -hmm. you know, somewhere between. 220th, right. you know, I'm not sure we yeah, exactly know where it's going to be area, yeah. um, yet, but we need to take advantage of this right now because if we don't vitalize Highway 99, the businesses and the people living that are going to be embarking on this will move to Linwood or they'll move to Shoreline or Mount Lake Terrace. Mm -hmm. So that's my urgency I have with the development of Highway 99. Okay, great. Well, let's talk about an uh, kind of an ongoing issue, I guess, that, mm -hmm. that the council has been dealing with that um, I just would love to get an update from you about, and that is just this whole Harbor Square business complex business and the, you know, the for those who maybe have been living under a rock for the last couple of years, you know, the concept of, uh, you know, there was a proposal by the Port of Edmonds to, in, uh, you know, to incorporate a master plan for mm -hmm. Harbor Square Business Complex into the, the city's comprehensive plan. Mm -hmm. And of course, the council decided that they didn't really like that plan and were looking at other options and the port withdrew their own. And now, um, my understanding is, is, is the council is now looking at some other options for maybe taking some staff recommendations for tweaking that plan and possibly taking it back through the planning board and I'm not really sure what the next steps are but I'd like to find out from your perspective because I know there have been some very robust discussions yes. at the council about this and where to go next um, from your perspective um, you know I guess quick update where is it and what do you think should happen next next in terms of what do we do with with Harbor Square well, I can tell you where it is right now um, the issues, we've actually looked at the planning board recommendations fairly recently and the planning board recommendations have gone to the one of our, our subcommittees, our PPP committee, which is the planning and the development committee, that are looking at doing it a what they call a decision tree on some of the main issues. Because there are certain issues within the development of Harbor Square that don't have agreement of a majority of council members and so they're starting to look at what is called a decision tree to decide if there is any sort of agreement in some of the more hotter issues where I think we should go with this personally on a personal level the mayor's already told us his staff doesn't have time to work on this plan mm -hmm. he's made it quite clear to us and I think that we would do best by accepting the port's withdrawal of the plan and backing out of the situation. I think what what's occurred is that the port came up with a plan that had much disagreement in it. Mm -hmm. 
And, and for those who haven't been following it, if, if we can kind of recap, uh, one of them was the fact that there was some residential uh, residential component to be incorporated, which people had concerns about because of the right. fact that there's some unstable, unstable soil, right. the, uh, and a few of them. liquefaction earthquake, zone. Yeah, and, and possibly, sure. and then of course height issues, sure. if there were some higher buildings that would be part of it that would maybe possibly sure. block some views or create too much density, sure. and there'd be traffic issues. And then there was one more, right? Some design issues, design maybe. Issues, yeah. Okay. And then issues um, in close proximity to the marsh. Right. And, right. You know, which is kind of a. It seems like that's an, a sticking point for a lot of people because there's some people sure. who say actually it was actually the friends of the marsh folks, right, who said actually if this puts some focus on the marsh, then maybe that's a good thing. So maybe it's okay to you know kind of develop it because it'll mean we'll actually take a closer look. And then there are people who say no, it's going to be bad for the marsh. So anyway, we kind of those are the issues we're looking at. Right. So right. given all that, now that we're all up to speed on, and I, I yeah, it is it is quite to be up to speed. Yeah. Um, I do think that the smarter thing for us to do, because I think one thing that we tend to forget that this is the port's property, it is a public entity in itself. We, I'm not sure that we should be determining specifically what the port should be doing down here in the minutia of it frankly i mean there are certain zoning regulations currently the port has quite a bit of flexibility to build down here they actually have quite a bit of flexibility to do a lot of things and my concern is that whatever the council comes up with the port's not going to want and the port the port has already said that they're not interested in um, at this time working with us to develop a new plan so whatever the council comes up with I'm not thinking the port's going to be in so much agreement with it so I think probably one of the smarter things to do would be to accept the ports withdraw of the plan and us stop the process itself and move forward and you know maybe right now it's not the time maybe in a year from now um, have more of a collaborative approach you know and uh, to developing this area but I I am concerned that whatever we come up with will not be something that the port has any interest in developing at all okay okay well we'll stay tuned we'll see yes. what happens next on yes. that one um, and so you know we have to talk about roaming animals because that has been that has been oh, yes. such a generator of con yes. comments and controversy um so the council very recently decided to um restore um uh in a in an animal roaming ordinance basically an ordinance that says people in essence have to maintain control of their animals and keep them from roaming yes um and that ordinance did not used to include cats and now it does which was the most recent decision and of course lots of impassioned testimony about why that was a good idea and um, sure. more comments after the fact about why it was not so just in a very simple terms um why do you think because you voted for it why do you think that is a good idea what i voted for was for animal owners to have responsibility for their animals um to me personally, whether it's a dog or a cat or some other domestic animal, um, a chicken, <laughs> you know, horse, whatever, whatever the case may be, um, I think animal animal owners have a responsibility to ensure that their animals don't impede on their neighbor's property, whatever it is. Now, that being said, no the city will not have the time to have our animal control officers driving around looking for cats in other people's yards um, or dogs in other people's yards for that effect what really will happen here is that people if you have a neighbor that has an animal that strays into your yard one would hope you would go over and ask your neighbor to um, please don't let your animal defecate in my yard or or whatever the case may be and the responsible animal owner will of course keep the animal on their own property now in the case that that doesn't happen this will give the ability for the property owner to call animal control to say there's a domestic animal in my yard defecating and animal control will be able to come out and take a look at the situation 
and that's that's really all it does and hopefully we can all just work together as a community and just ensure that we keep our animals in our own properties that's all it is okay. and you know there's still the Teresa there's lots of areas in Edmonds where where we will still have cats roaming um, where neighbors don't care if their neighbors cats are in their yard you know I use myself as my as an example I Tuesday before the council I looked out my window with my cup of coffee and there was two cats in my garden wandering around and and you know I thought to myself you know so be it they're out there they're they're enjoying my yard they're not tampering with too much and to me it's not a big deal and I think most neighborhoods you're not going to find homeowners that are going to be all upset and out of shape because they may have dogs or cats in their yards necessarily but now this ordinance gives our animal control some teeth to do something about it. Okay. okay. Well, we did talk a little bit about um, already about economic development, and you know, you talked about your focus on Highway 99. But mm -hmm. in general, are there other ideas that you have for assuming that you agree with the idea that Edmonds does need more economic development? What are some other things that the city could look at? You know, and. Since I've been on council in the last four years, I think we've had a really good hard look at the various living areas around Edmonds. So um, Westgate and Five Corners and, and Furdale and Perrinville and, you know, we've had a good look at the various areas and thought, well, you know, we could help create some development here by doing this. So we're in the process, you know, we brought in folks from the University of Washington that have taken a look at the various areas and they're making recommendations and and I think it's a it's a great thing I mean I think it's to revitalize our areas but I think an important thing we have to remember is that individual neighborhoods have to be able to give input you know I, I it's kind of difficult for me to to grasp when um, neighbors aren't asked or talked about or the open hearings the public hearings we have let people come in and talk about what they want to see in their areas mm -hmm. I think is important mm -hmm. you know economic development is a is a fine thing and it, it's something that keeps our city alive and it keeps the vitality of it but that's not what makes a city what makes a city is the citizens within the city and that's where we need to be Um, you know, one thing that I've heard on and off since I've been covering city council meetings has been, um, and this is just, you know, a, a, a critic, you know, there's always sure. going to be critics, and some sure. people say, and I wouldn't say it's, I've heard it from a huge number of people, but a few people, that the council tends to micromanage things, that they tend to get too involved in all the details, and that the, you know, things maybe that are, would be best left to staff handling or that, that kind sure. of thing. Do you think that's a fair criticism or not? Well, I think that can be construed at certain points. I think it is a fine line. Um, we do have accountability to the citizens for the decisions we make. We do need to know, have all the information in front of us before we make decisions. We count on the staff to make those decisions generally. Um, I think on occasion, sometimes council lines maybe get blurred um, with city staff lines. I, I tend to to stay away from that quite a bit working you know I spent my career working for the state of Washington in various capacities and I certainly understand what the duty is of the staff and who they report to and and just by my own experience so I I tend to stay away from telling the staff what they should be doing or when they should be doing it but there is a fine line because we have to have that information to make those decisions mm -hmm. so whether it's a fair criticism or not, I'm not sure. You know, it depends, I guess, which side you're looking at it from. Right. Well, and I've always thought that council members in general have a really tough job because you don't have um, full-time staff people who are doing research for you no. or helping you find answers. It's pretty much something that you're all doing 
you know, in a relatively not really a paid a paid job, um, right. other than a minimal amount of pay, um, and an awful lot of hours that you put in. So I'm sure that's a challenge. Well, it is. It is. You're you're very right. We have a part time staff, and um, that we have 20 hours a week, and that includes council meetings. So if mm -hmm. you take out council meeting, yeah, we probably have 15 hours a week of a staff, and it, it's unfortunate because all of our contact with the, the city staff, all the questions, if everything was filtered through an individual versus us all asking those same questions, it would make their job a little bit, you know, more reasonable too. Right, right. Um, so we've got a, a reserve fund in the city mm -hmm. um, for litigation that's at about $215,000 and that's about a third of what the target was when it was set up a year ago. Do you think that, that that's something that we should, um, you know, kind of re- uh, Replenish. Replenish. Thank you. That was the word I was looking for. <laughs> Replenish before we come up with other uses for that? You know, I think the reason the litigation fund was started, it had to do with having um, all of a sudden bills come up regarding various issues, whether it's land use or it's personnel or it's whatever it might be. And we didn't have the money there to do it with, you know. So I think this fund was really started in order to have a dedicated fund so we knew where to take the money from. It was budgeted. And it, it made sense at the time mm -hmm. to do. Mm -hmm. So um, we'll see what happens in the next budget. We're about to start the the 14 budget. So we'll see what gets put in there then. And, and what do you see, speaking of the budget in general, um, for the future? I know that right now we're, we're looking pretty good um, and the economy yes. has picked up and housing you know, is starting to yes. pick up. Yes. But still long term, my understanding is, is that there's questions about you know, in was it 2015 or so that we'll start looking at some red ink again. So what is your thinking about what the council needs to do to address that? You know, that's a good question. I think our council has done a very, very good job with the assistance of the staff and the mayor, all of us as a whole, at looking at expenditures, what we're spending them on, why we're spending them. I think this council has done more than any other councils had to do because they didn't have the economic downturn that we faced. Mm -hmm. So in the last four years, I think we're, we're much more smarter in how we're spending our dollars, much more wiser in how we spend it, I guess. You know, and I, I'm, I'm hoping coupled with that and our development in the various areas that we're going to stay at a stable. You know, it's kind of interesting that you bring that up for 15 because I've been on council now since 2009, and since 2009 every year, I hear about us going into the red mm -hmm. the following year, and right. we need to be careful because we're going to right. be, you know, running into the red and not into the black. And it seems every year we're able to make some really hard decisions that and one of the some of the decisions I was involved in in the last couple of years had to do with the uh, uh, staff contracts. You know, the staff and the council worked together really closely to ensure that the medical insurance was changed, and that saved us, you know, a considerable amount of money. And that that the contracts were fair and and the staff were agreeable to it. It's just a matter of us working together as a team with the people that work within the city to help figure out how we can save money. Um, we most recently did the retirement, the early retirement buyout, you know, where people retired and, and um, as long as we didn't have to fill their positions again. And so that saves money. Every little bit has saved us money. And you know, we have a new finance director who's came from the county council, from up in the county, mm -hmm. um, Roger. and. We're certainly hoping that with his expertise that we'll continue to watch this and pay attention to it. Um, where we're going, you know, the, the finance committee and council the other night, Roger gave a presentation where he wants to move our reserves up to 32%, I think it was, or 34%, 30, somewhere around there, 
percentage for our reserve fund when it's been at a much lower level. So I think we're just being a little bit smarter with the way we're, we're doing business. Mm -hmm. So the kind of the short answer at this point is probably that, you know, we'll kind of see how it goes on a case by, you know, year by year basis, hope, you know, hope that we can figure out between the fact the economy is getting better and maybe there might be some more efficiencies that we can achieve. Um, do you see and what you know now that there might be a, a need to go out for a levy again? You know, I mean, I keep thinking about the streets because right. Phil Williams, bless his heart, you know, he's doing right. the best he can trying to figure out Phil Williams, public works right. director, um, how to patch up these streets that have not been redone in many, many years, or the aging sewer right. lines and the aging water lines, and I mean, that's something. Hundred year overlays just aren't yeah. going to yeah. so, keep us going. So the question is, you know, yeah. we tried tried to do a levy a few years ago, and that failed. Yes. Um, the economy's better. Do you see that in the cards at all, or is it too early to say? Well, I think I think we have to continue to look at it pretty closely. We've had two discussions of having levies last year and this year and both times um, this the city came back to the council and said look we don't appear to need it right now you, you know there were really good reasons as to not run it right now so I don't think this council is afraid necessarily to run one if everything's in order around it and one of our bigs it one of the big issues is the streets I've had multiple conversations even as of today with a citizen about some of the roads that people are enduring you know with potholes and and chip curbs and no sidewalks and it goes on and on and on and it you know it's only going to get worse unless we figure this out you know having our roads on a hundred year overlay plan is not probably sufficient mm -hmm. to ensure that our, our, our streets are well maintained. Yeah, yeah, it is a big problem and it seems, uh, I guess I, I could say that it seems like many cities are facing the same thing. I think Linwood yes. has that same issue um, as well as probably some other nearby municipalities. Um, so quick Quick, uh, two quick questions for you. I've asked this. You know, other, I can't do people. quick. I'm a politician. Well, I think you can. Do, I think you can do this one. This is if you were going to describe, in just a few words, Edmund's greatest strength and its greatest weakness. What would that be? It's people. People's the strength. Oh yeah, it's. it's my, <laughs> we wouldn't want to say people's the weakness, right? <laughs> no, no, no. I don't even have to think about that one for a minute. Okay. Um, you know, the people are its strengths. You know, in in. Doorbelling as I've been doorbelling in various areas of the city. Um, what a marvelous group of engaged people. And that is something that most cities do not have, is an engaged people. Second you know, highest voter turnout in the state. Yeah, and yeah. the county, we're the highest in the, I mean, we care, we're engaged, people pay attention, and that is what most cities don't have. So, and our volunteers, we have... Geez, we're having a volunteer picnic this Sunday mm -hmm. at City Park, and I, I believe I heard that we have about 150 volunteers in our cities that are in boards and commissions. That is amazing. Yeah, that's great. Well, it, it's just an amazing use of stuff. So, yeah. you know, I'm hoping that, that you know, we'll continue to, to keep our city thriving by having an engaged population. Okay. What about the weakness? Our biggest weakness? Mm -hmm. We'll never have enough money to do what we want to do. That's a good one. Well, good one. it's true. Mm -hmm. We'll never have enough money because, you know, if we, we fix the road issue, then it's going to be another issue. It's just a, a constant battle to ensure that we've got enough money to make our city just as lovely as we want it. Edmonds is a beautiful place to live, and I think we're all very, very fortunate to be able to live in Edmonds. Mm -hmm. and, in order to do that, we're going to have to figure out ways of doing things, you know, maybe more different than we've done in the 90s and the early 2000s. Okay. You know? Well, we, we are now coming to the end, so you have an opportunity to tell folks if there's one thing that you would like them to remember when they see your name on the ballot, what is that kind of a closing sentence or two, if you, if you will. Sure. And uh, then let people know how they can reach you if they want to learn more about you. Sure. I think one of the things I want people to remember about me is that I promise I will, I will listen to you and I will represent the whole city. 
I just don't represent certain cities of the city. I'm, I'm one of two council members that don't live in the view corridor of Edmonds. And I know what people are facing on the outskirts of Edmonds, and I will listen, and I am there, and I am part of you, and I, I am out there. So when you look at my name, that's what I want you to think about. And to reach me, all you have to do is go onto my website, which is adrianmonillas.com. Okay. M O N I L L A S, right? In Very case good. People are wondering how to spell it. Very okay. good. <laughs> Very good. Okay, well, thank you so much for stopping by and good luck. Thank you, Teresa. Thanks a lot.